because I was afraid that everybody would just immediately run out if Van told you that it was going to be me this morning, see? But uh, you're stuck with me, and the evening crowd will at least get Sam, so they, they lucked out. Uh, you know, every time I turn around and read anything, I find out that fewer and fewer people on the face of the earth believe there's a God. And out of those fewer and fewer people, there is even a less number that believe the Bible is inspired of God. There's a lot of religions, and they really don't believe the Bible, even though they may claim to be a Christian religion. I know that's hard for you to believe. It's hard for us to believe. But it's true. It, it, and it's really kind of a shame that so few people really know anything about what the Bible really says about any topic because it has an absolute wealth of information in it. Absolute wealth. Now, you and I, folks here today, we believe the Bible. We know what the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, how he wrote that all Scripture is given by inspiration to God, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. And we know that this same Apostle Paul wrote to this same Timothy, and he told him, you need to study this Bible. You need to study about it. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I like that part about dividing. And if you think something about that word, there are divisions in the Bible. You know, we've got verses that man's put in there. We've got books. But to, I'm going to tell you there's a great division in the Bible. There's a great division between the Old Testament, law and prophets, and the law of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you, a lot of people do not understand that division whatsoever. Church of Christ, we follow the law of Christ. We're not under that Old Testament law. And I want you to understand that. I think that's really important. You get the first hint of that, actually, from the great writer in the Old Testament, Moses himself. He wrote in Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. In other words, he's going to be a lawgiver. Like unto me. Unto him shall you hearken. In other words, when that person comes, you need to listen to him. And that person is Jesus Christ. That's who we need to listen to today. And that's the things that are written in the New Testament. You know, while Jesus was here on earth, if you, we get another hint about this, when at the Mount of Transfiguration, remember that situation? Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and they go up on the mountain. Remember how Jesus' face shines, his garments become white as snow, and he's there talking to Moses and Elijah the great lawgiver of the Old Testament, the, who the Jews consider to be by far the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, Elijah. They're talking, and Peter is there, and you know how Peter is. He comes up with this idea. He says, Lord, and he's talking to Jesus, he says, it's good for us to be here, and I think we ought to make three tabernacles, one to you, one to Moses, lawgiver of the Old Testament, and one to Elijah, the great prophet of the Old Testament. Right as he's saying this, there's a bright cloud that comes by, and there's a voice out of the cloud. 
You know what the voice says? And I'm going to tell you it's the voice of God. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. He didn't say hear Elijah, and he didn't say hear Moses. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. All right? If there's any doubt about it, the apostle Paul even made this a little bit clearer. When he is writing to the Galatians, he says, Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after the faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. Schoolmaster is the Old Testament. After that, it's going to bring us to Christ. After that, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. So anytime we have a question about the Old Testament or something, it is there for us to learn by, but we're not under it. We're under the law of Jesus Christ. Now, I've got a rather long reading because if you read the book of Colossians, Denny covered that not too long ago on Wednesday, it has got a lot of information in there about how we're no longer under the law. I'm going to read this because I love Colossians and I love the sentiment that the apostle puts in there. This is in the second chapter. As ye therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power and whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being now dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses? Now I want you to pay special attention to this next verse. He says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So there's no doubt that Jesus Christ nailed the Old Testament the old ordinances, the old laws to his, to his cross when he died. You know, I've said all this, but actually the things I want to tell you now are out of the Old Testament. I just want you to realize the importance of the New Testament. Don't lose sight of that because that's what we follow. I like what the Apostle Paul said to the Romans, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. He didn't say for our doing. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. In other words, the Old Testament scriptures has some things in it that we can learn from. You can learn a lot about what God is like. How he treats people that do what he wants them to do how he treats people that don't do what he wants them to do, how he interacts and how he thinks. There's a lot of that thought within the things that, that are written in the Old Testament and how he treated those Israelite people, what his expectations of, from people were. So we can learn a bunch of things. One of the things that we can learn is about health. Now, I know that sounds weird, 
And I know you all are sitting back there with masks and you're, you're paying a lot of attention to all this COVID-19 stuff and all the things. And it amazes me, though, sometimes, how that a book, and Moses is going to be the writer of the things that I'm going to talk about today. Moses lived about 1,400 to 1,500 years before Jesus Christ. That's about 3,400 to 3,500 years ago. And I just want to read to you some of the things that this Moses guy, inspired by God, wrote down. And then think about how we act today. I don't know. I'm, I'm, our doctors and stuff, and I love doctors. Don't get me wrong about this. If I got sick, I'd want to go to the doctor. But there's a lot of confusion sometimes, even in the medical industry. I don't know if you guys have paid any attention, but there's been a lot of confusion from the CDC about even how we ought to act today. Okay? Some confusion about that. And I think about the things that God wrote, had Moses to write, 3,500 years ago, there really isn't much confusion about. I think, do you realize that the first president of the United States, everybody knows that's George Washington. Anybody knows how he died? Well, I'm going to tell you, if you don't know how he died, his doctors killed him. They said best medical doctors of the day, we think we need to let the blood out of this guy. Now, I know that's only 200 years ago, but I'm telling you, 3,500 years ago, something that God said, for the life is in the flesh, is in the blood. Now, if somebody decides that they're going to make you well by letting your blood out of you, you... I want you to change your doctors right now because that's not a good idea. For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. So, you know, old George's doctors, if they would have just read the Bible, they would have said, that's not a good idea. It's just not a good idea to let this blood out of this guy. I look at a lot of these things that's written, and we're going to go to Leviticus, and it's got a lot of things in there. Leviticus, if you'd read, normally, and I'll tell you this, I'm just going to be honest with you guys. When I've read Leviticus, most of the time I get bored to death because it has so many do this, do that, all these little regulations and stuff. But today I find it fascinating, the things that, Oh, Moses penned in there from the, from the inspiration of God. You can go and look in the 11th chapter of Leviticus, and a lot of Leviticus 11th chapter is about the things that those people could eat and the things that they couldn't eat. Okay? Don't eat this. It's not good for you. You can eat this. It'd be good for you. And one of, probably one of the most common things we think about today, pork. Could they eat pork? Couldn't do it. Now, I eat pork. I'm going to tell you, I eat pork today. But they, God told them, don't eat pork, okay? And people know today that if you don't cook pork really, really good, you can pick up some parasites that absolutely will destroy you. You can do it today. I never have pork sushi. I don't know about you all. Denny, I, I'll have a little sushi every now and then, but I've never had pork sushi because it's just not a good idea. And then people back then, they didn't know about really cooking really, really good. So, you know, God just said, stay away from that stuff. And you know them Israelites did it because archaeologists today they'll go over there, you go to the land of Israel, and right beside them was the Philistines. And you know how they figure out today where the Philistines lived and where the Israelites lived? I'll tell you how. They dig down, 
And when they pine pork bones, the Philistines ate it hand over foot. And when they go to another little town, and no pork bones there, that's an Israelite town. And those archaeologists know that for a fact today. Because these Israelites paid attention. They didn't get sick from that pork not having it cooked just right. But he tells them a lot of other things. If you go look at the 12th chapter of Leviticus, he talks about what a woman's supposed to do that's had a baby. And I, I, I find this interesting to me. Here he is telling a woman what to do. I'm going to read a couple of these verses. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived seed and born a man-child, she sh then she shall be unclean seven days. Now, I want to get this, cover this topic of being unclean in the Old Testament. Unclean versus clean. Unclean basically was a label that you put on people if you wanted them separated. You had two groups. Unclean, they stay over here. Clean, they stay over here because we don't want them to intermix. Sometimes, sometimes, it's because you didn't want the clean group to get sick but actually, sometimes, it was to protect the wounds that were classified as unclean. Woman has a child. She's told, hey, she's unclean. That means she needs to stay separated. And it says, and then the eighth day of the flesh of his foreskin, if she's had a man child, he's going to be circumcised. And she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty-three days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come to the sanctuary. Those women were not allowed, I'd say in today's thing, they're not allowed to come to church for over a month. Actually, about forty-some days, if you look at that. Don't come to church. Don't come to the sanctuary. Don't touch any hallowed thing. Well, why wouldn't they want to touch a hallowed thing? Think something's going to zap them? Well, you know what? The same reason I don't like you all to come in and touch the doors back there, every one of you, because 40 other people have just touched that door, and when you touch that door, you might be going to get some virus, you might be getting some germs, you might be going to get some uh, bacteria, you might be going to get some of this stuff. He tells that lady, don't, don't touch that stuff. Don't even go to the sanctuary. And you know, if a woman's just had a baby, you know who's probably with her all the time? I'm betting that baby is. And this is just kind of a protection mechanism that God said 3,500 years ago, let's just keep her separated for a little while. Sometimes you wonder. I know when Sue, a long time ago, had kids, uh, she didn't come to church for a while. People, I'm, I remember the first child we had, they wondered if we was ever going to come to church, or Sue was ever going to come back to church with the kid again. I think some people thought about that maybe about when Sarah and, and Kyle had a child. Are well, we ever going to see them kids? Well, if you stop and think about it, actually God in the Old Testament kind of told them, stay away for a while. Let that kid build up some immunity and get him out there and be healthy. Okay? If you go to the 13th chapter of Leviticus, it talks about a disease. Now, this was a bad disease. The disease he's talking about here is leprosy, okay? It's just one of the diseases he covers here in Leviticus. But I want to read some of the things about, he said here in Leviticus, about leprosy. And the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, saying, When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, a bright spot, in the skin of the flesh like the plague of leprosy, then it shall be brought into Aaron the priest, or into one of his sons the priest. And the priest shall look on the plague of the skin of the flesh. And when the hair in the plague is turned white, and the plague is sight be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is the plague of leprosy. And the priest shall look at him and pronounce him unclean. Unclean. We're going to separate this guy a little bit. If the bright spot be white and in the skin of the flesh and in the sight not deeper than the skin and the, half, and the hair thereof be not turned white, then the priest shall shut him up that hath the plague seven days. 
Carrie, that's called, we call that quarantine today. But you know what? 3,500 years ago, the Lord God told Moses to write down about somebody's got something bad, let's, let's quarantine this guy for about seven days. Now listen to what happens next. The, free, the priest, and then the priest shall look on him the seventh day, and behold, if the plague in his sight be at a stay, and the plague spread not in the skin, then the priest shall shut him up seven days more. 14-day quarantine. I don't know if anybody's heard about 14-day quarantines or anything. The CDC is thinking maybe that's a good time to quarantine, but they got their best scientists working on this stuff, but they're not really sure, you know. But I think it's interesting that the Lord God knows about disease. And if, if, if these doctors and these scientists would just read the Bible there wouldn't be near as much confusion about a lot of this stuff. Because he says, you know, do that. And if you had this same priest looking at this stuff every time they brought somebody with leprosy, whether well, does he have it or not? You see, they're not even sure right now that this guy's got leprosy, but we're still quarantining him, okay? So if you wonder about some of this stuff that goes on today, God already knows about it, Okay? He understands this idea of social distancing because that was the idea of the clean versus the unclean. We want the unclean to be social distance from the clean, okay? That's, that's the main gist of this. I think it's interesting also in this same 13th chapter, you could go down to about the 34th verse, and this guy, if he's sick, you know, it tells him, you got to wash his clothes, he's got to wash his clothes, he's got to wash his body, he's got to get himself really clean. Over and over, all right? And if he really think he's got something bad down in the 44th and 45th verses, destroy his clothes. Don't just wash them. Get them destroyed. Get rid of those clothes. You know, Carrie, I can imagine somebody being sick enough and got something that might be catching. It would be just better off just to get rid of them clothes. Matter of fact, in the 55th verse of this, he tells them to burn them. Burn the clothes. If it's, you know, look, look this situation over, priest. You, you might just want to burn them clothes. You go on over into the 14th uh, chapter of this same book of Leviticus, and he's talking about this guy. We're not sure. He may be, he may be recovering from this. And I, I like this. We think he might be recovering. But in the eighth verse, he that is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, wash himself in water that he may be clean, and after that he shall come to the camp and shall tarry abroad out of his tent seven days, and it shall be on the seventh day that he shall shave all the hair off his head, his beard, his eyebrows, even the hair he shall shave off. He will wash his clothes, he shall wash all his flesh in water, and he shall be clean." Get ready out of there, all the hair, because you might not, you still might have some germ or some virus or something still. You'd just be better off to get rid of all that stuff and wash and wash and wash. What's the CDC finally say? Well, they said it'd be a good idea if you had washed for about 20 seconds or so. You really want to stay away from stuff according to the Bible, and you want to get washed and washed and washed and washed. All right? It even gets worse than this. The priest is supposed to go to the house of where this guy that had the leprosy. Now, leprosy was a bad thing now, I'm telling you. He investigated the house, and if he thought that that leprosy had enough of that guy been hanging around in that house, you know what he told him to do? Tear the house now. Get rid of it. Now, I know in some of these drug situations where they've been cooking meth and all that stuff, stuff that Maxie runs into every once in a while, every now and then they tear down one of them houses. You know what? God said, in some cases, that's a good idea. You know, because this stuff is bad stuff. Stay away from it. Destroy that house. You go over and look in the 15th chapter. And 
if you look at, again, it's not about leprosy. This is just about a guy that's got a running sore. He's got a sore on him. And I like this down about the fifth verse. There. And whosoever touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean till the evening. He that setteth on anything where he set hath an issue, shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean. And he that toucheth the flesh of him that hath the issue shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water. And it goes on down through here. The whole chapter, everything that anybody did around this guy, anywhere near, you know what they did? They had to wash their clothes, they had to bathe themselves, and they had to separate, at least for a day, from everybody else. So, you know, it's interesting to me that it took mankind 3,500 years to kind of figure out these things that God had written a long, long time ago just might be right. I'm going to tell you, there was no other society 3,500 years ago that was doing anything like any of these things that I've just told you about. There's not a thing. They didn't do this stuff. You know why? Because God understands health. He made us. He understands the whole situation. And the words he has penned in this book, the Bible, that we ought to be studying a lot more of ourselves, and I'd love for our scientists and our doctors to look at it because it, I'm just touching, just barely touching on some of the great wisdom that's in this book. It's great wisdom. And I think it's so odd that our folks, our best people that we have today can be so wishy-washy on some of these subjects. And it's as clear as it can be in the Bible how you treat severe situations. Look at the Bible. You think men's smart? You think doctors are smart? Some of them are. But I'm going to tell you that the Bible is always smarter. Every case. We get to thinking we know a lot. Nothing compared to what's written in this book. I'm going to read one more passage out of the Old Testament. I'm going over to Numbers, the fifth chapter around. The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper. Separate them. Everyone that hath an issue, separate them. Whosoever is defiled by the dead. You touch a dead body, you use part of the Old Testament, out of the camp, you've got to stay out for a while. We don't know what for sure killed that guy. And you may have just caught something off of him, and we don't want you here infecting the rest of us. Okay? So when we look around amongst ourselves and see some of these things, and we wonder why we act this way. Just remember, God put some regulations to those old people about this. Now, there's one, one scripture I really wanted uh, to cover here. i got to find it. And it's back in Leviticus. And he's talking about this leper. Now, listen to these words because I find this so appropriate. And the leper in whom the plague is... His clothes shall be rent. In other words, they, they destroy the guy's clothes. And his head bare. They wanted him to shave his head because that hair and stuff carries germs and virus and stuff like that. And he shall put a covering upon his upper lip. Carl. And he shall put a covering upon his upper lip. And you know what else he does? It, the very next part of the verse says, and he will say, if somebody's coming to him, unclean, unclean. And you know, if I'm doing this and I say unclean, unclean, I'll bet you Van stays a little bit away from me. You see, when we're wearing masks, we just covered our upper lip. God knows what to do. 
All we got to do is look in this book and you can learn so much. That's the point I'm trying to get across to you today. Look at the book. The book is full of wisdom. Now, I told you we're not under these Old Testament regulations. We're not. and Because I, I don't want you to get the idea we're under these regulations. But Paul said we could learn. There's a lot of things to learn back here. I look at the things that are written in the New Testament. Things that are written in the New Testament, I love what James wrote. Pure religion, an undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Pure religion, you need to stay undefiled and you need to stay unspotted. Now what he's talking about isn't health, isn't, I want to rephrase that, is not physical health. He's talking, in the New Testament, is focused upon our moral and our spiritual health. That's what the focus is. And you know why? I want you all to be healthy. I, I, we're doing all kinds of things here to try to keep you healthy, physically. But I tell you what, it's much more important to be spiritually healthy. And that's what Jesus Christ focused on. Why? Well, <clears throat> for starters, we're not going to be here very long. My dad lived till he was 98 years old, and he said, John, it just went like that. We're not going to be here very long. I'd like to be physically healthy while I'm here, but the gist of it is it's far more important to be spiritually healthy than it is physically healthy. And that's the things that Jesus Christ focused on, our moral and our spiritual health. If you're not a Christian, you can become one. And you know what? If, you, if you've been defiled, and if you're not a Christian, you are defiled. You're unclean, but you can be washed. Yeah? You know what the Apostle Paul was told? He was actually called Saul of Tarsus. Back there when Ananias come to see him, Ananias told the Apostle Paul, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So if you're out of Christ, you can get healthy, spiritually healthy, by being washed, washed in the waters of baptism. If you have become a Christian and you've stepped back, you can become healthy again. You can ask for the prayers of the church. You can change what you're doing and get spiritually healthy again. If anybody needs help in any way, please come at this time as Dave sings. <laughs>